Hello everyone, welcome back once again. I am Nicodemus Kane. Today is February the 9th, 2023. Um, I had a little bit of a coughing fit earlier, so my voice is not doing so hot right now. It's been a, uh, it's been an interesting morning already. I'm not going to go into details, just, uh, it's already been interesting. Um, but yeah, I had a coffin fit. I, I'm still cleaning out from being sick. Uh, we supposedly had a heck of a rainstorm last night, but I don't know. I didn't hear it. I slept right through it. I don't know if the power went off or not. I don't think it did. We got warnings that it was going to be that bad of a storm, but I don't think anything really happened. I don't know. I didn't get any water in the basement, which is good. But then again, the water in the basement usually doesn't come until the day after. So, and that's usually because all the water goes straight down to through the dirt, straight down to the sides of our basement, underneath the basement, and then it fills up. Um, yes, we are still trying to fix that. In other news, uh, I really don't have anything else. Um, we're on Jeremiah 41. We're going to see if, um, who was it that said that they came from the north to tell Gedaliah that, who was it that was coming to kill him? I'm looking, hold on a second. I have to be reminded. Ishmael, is that what it was? Ishmael? Yes, dost thou know certainly that Baalus, the king of the Ammonites, remember the Ammonites, the Ammonites, the Amalekites, the Jebusites, hath sent Ishmael the son of Nethaniah to slay thee. So I said, I said yesterday, we're, we are in the middle of a biblical soap opera. So I am ready to see where this goes, actually. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Um... Not only that, but I really, I'm kind of behind. I had to, uh, I had to reply to a comment on a, uh, another channel. Um, it was, uh, who was it? UBTV was talking about, uh, the Mississippian culture. And, uh, I had to, uh, talk about our trip that we made out there last year that I said that I don't, I don't buy that these people would spend 400 years hauling bags of dirt, you know, one bag after another up this hill to make this mound for a tribal chief that wouldn't be alive by the time they finished it. I just don't buy that. Um, then I also said, you know, this the culture was way bigger than anybody could have ever thought because these mounds are everywhere. All the way down the Mississippi River, all the way down the Ohio River, all, everywhere. And not only that, but there are mounds just within the time that I wrote that. And now I'm finding out about the mounds that are inside of Indiana. I haven't even talked about that yet. That uh, there's a guy... Another channel I found, I cannot remember his name, but he lives in Indiana. I think he lives in Franklin, which is like 30 minutes away from us, which is pretty cool. Um, but he talks about mounds. He has a video that's talking about mounds and talking about giants, uh, skeletons that they found throughout Indiana. And it pops something in my head. You have this Mississippian culture that's all the way across the rivers that are living inside of these huge cities, monstrous, huge cities that have made these 12, 10 to 12 foot tall, four foot thick walls that encircle their cities. That uh, just huge walls. It's kind of like, you know, why would they have to make the the uh, Great Wall of China, you know, 20 feet tall for six foot Mongolians? You know, I, I can get that you'd make it 10 feet, but 
why would you need to make it that tall just for you know six foot Mongolians? But it got me thinking. There are so many reports and newspaper clippings and articles and discoveries of these mounds all over Indiana of giants. And then you have this Mississippian culture, which they may or may not have been seven foot tall either. We don't know. You know, we, we just have, we have the mounds. We don't have the huts or anything else. They have interpretations of what they think the huts could have been like, but they don't have any proof. What if that's what it was? What if the giants were in Indiana and they were on the, they were in the Mississippi Valley? On the, the Mississippi River Valley, the floodplains. What if that's what it was? Just speculation. I know nothing. I, I know nothing. I have nothing. All I have is what they tell us and what I can kind of put together in my head. But it makes sense to a point. I mean, we have stories upon stories upon stories of these native american cultures that were constantly being harassed by giants what if that was part of it just speculation i don't know i really don't know you you put that together with the whole you know america being egypt thing and it becomes something far more interesting you know they they call this land the heartland of america because it is it is the most fruitful land in America. It's Illinois, Ohio, Indiana, uh, Kentucky, to a point. Um, all of these areas. This is where that where it all grows. What if what if there's something to that? I'm not saying that Indiana is the promised land or anything, but I I don't know. I really don't know. There's something to it, I think, though. There's definitely something there that we can put together. A lot of people will listen to that and they'll say, hey, you know, you're just... You're trying to put something there that's not... To, trying to put something together that's not there. It's like, no, we have this Mississippian culture and they have remnants of these walls that were really, really tall. We didn't go over to the walls. I wish we would have. Um, I didn't realize they were four feet thick. Now that I look back at it, I'm like, holy crap, those walls were four feet, four feet thick. That surrounded these cities. And they were all on the eastern side. When we were down in the Angel Mounds in Evansville, they were on the northern side. Evansville is in the southern tip of Indiana. The walls at Cahokia were on the eastern side, pointing towards Indiana. What if there's a connection there? I'm just speculating. But there are many. many we, we have a mound that's less than five minutes away from us right now. I didn't even know that. That they had bulldozed down. They call it a hill. They call it Hogback Hill. You can actually look it up. They call it Hogback Hill. It sits in somebody's backyard. I doubt the guy even knows that he has what used to be a mound in his backyard. We're planning a trip up there um, on a weekend or something. Maybe we can talk to the guy. See if he knows what's up. But it sits right on a creek. And it's a mound. I, I never knew. I never knew. And and now I'm like, every single little hill I see, every time we go out, I'm like, it's, could that be something? Holy smokes. But they said that they found an eight-foot-tall skeleton inside of that mound. We, it's like, it's like Abraham Lincoln said, is that, you know, we built this nation upon the the backs of these giants that used to be here before us. Now, of course, people can say, well, he was talking about, you know, the uh, commanders and generals and whatever that were here fighting for it, you know, all that stuff. But 
in a literal sense, we live on the backs of John. I, I, I don't know what else to say, man. It's crazy stuff. Um, anyways, let's read Jeremiah 41. Let's see what's going to happen to uh, Gedaliah. Is that right? Yes. Let's see what's going to happen here, because I got a feeling something's going to happen. That, that biblical, uh, biblical soap opera. That's good stuff. It's good stuff. Anyways, I, I want to do another video of the uh, the mounds eventually. Um, just not not right now. I, I will talk about it more as we go, but definitely not right now. All right. Now it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elish, Elisha, Elishama, Elishama, Nethaniah, the son of Elishama, of the seed royal, and the princes of the king, even ten men with him, came unto Gedaliah, the son of Aachim, to Mitzpah. And there they did eat bread together in Mitzpah. Then arose Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the ten men that were with him, and smote Gedaliah, the son of Aachim, the son of Shaphan, with the sword, and slew him, whom the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. Ishmael also slew all the Jews that were with him, even with Gedaliah at Mitzpah, and the Chaldeans that were found there, and the men of war. And it came to pass the second day, after he had slain Gedaliah, and no man knew it, that there came certain from Shechem, from Shiloh, and from Samaria, even fourscore men, having their beards shaven and their clothes rent, and having cut themselves and with offerings and incense in their hand to bring them to the house of the Lord. And Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, went forth from Mitzpah to meet them, weeping all along as he went. And it came to pass, as he met them, he said unto them, Come to Gedaliah, the son of Aachim. And it was so. When they, when they came into the midst of the city, that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, slew them and cast them into the midst of the pit, he and the men that were with him. Then ten men were found among them that said unto Ishmael, Slay us not, for we have treasures in the field of wheat and of barley and of oil and of honey. So he forbear and slew them not among their brethren. Now the pit wherein Ishmael had cast all the dead bodies of the men whom he had slain because of Gedaliah, was it which Asa the son Asa the king had made for fear of Baasha, king of Israel. And Ishmael the son of Nethaniah filled it with them that were slain. Then Ishmael carried away captive all the residue of the people that were in Mitzpah, even the king's daughters and all the people that remained in Mitzpah, whom Nebuzar Aden, the captain of the guard, had committed to Gedaliah the son of Aachim, and Ishmael the son of Nethaniah carried them away captive and departed to go over to the Am Ammonites. I knew it was going to happen. I, I just, I knew it. As soon as somebody says, hey, guess what? Somebody's coming to kill you. And they're like, no, nah, it's not going to happen. And then sure enough, it's like the next day. It's like the dude comes in, breaks bread with him, and then he kills him. Um, I was getting some Julius Caesar vibes. Uh, it's been a lot of people that have proposed the question what if Julius Caesar wasn't even a real person I don't know if he was or wasn't I, I can't say for certain um, some people have speculated that they've said you know it's entirely possible who knows for certain um, but you get in that vibe you know that they all came in broke bread with him and then you know one guy came up and stabbed him in the back it's like, it, it too, Ishmael, you know, I don't know, I'd, I'd like to think that Julius Caesar is still real, um, the others, there's enough, there's enough out there, but at the same time, at the same time, we want to talk about all this other kind of stuff in America, and it's like, is this stuff even real? Is George Washington like this this um, what do you want to say is he like a 
facsimile of Julius Caesar. So they, they do kind of look... If, if you ever really look at like a carved image of Julius Caesar and look at an image of George Washington, it makes you think. So maybe that's what it is. Maybe George Washington is just the new Julius Caesar. I don't know. Maybe Julius Caesar's made up too. Maybe they're both based upon something else that we haven't seen yet. I don't know. There's there's a lot going on there that I don't I don't have any proof. All I have is what other people have said and all I can say is, you know, maybe well, we've been told so many lies, who knows anymore. All right. So let's go back up to the top and read through this. So now it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishama, of the seed royal, and the princes of the king, even ten men with him, came unto Gedaliah, the son of Aachim, to Metzbah. And there they did eat bread together in Metzbah. I'm just not having a good day today. So he came down with a whole bunch of people with him. Even ten men came down, and they all broke bread together. Then arose Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the ten men that were with him, and smote Gedaliah, the son of Aachim, the son of Shaphan, with the sword, and slew him, whom the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. Now, this is the king of the Ammonites. We're looking down at Jerusalem. We're getting messages from Jerusalem that said, Hey, the king of the Babylons just took Jerusalem. He just took, took all these places. And the, the king of the Ammonites said, Well, psh, now, that the, now that the Jews are, are scattered... Now that God is not fighting on their side anymore, hey, let's go take it. Because they knew. Because they had gone through that war before. They said, hey, no man can stand against those people. But now that their God has abandoned them, let's go for it. Let's do it. Uh, verse 3. Ishmael also slew all the Jews that were with him, even with Gedaliah at Mitzpah. And the Chaldeans that were found there, and the men of war. You just get the feeling that you know you're you're going to poke the Babylonian bear, and this is what you're going to get. And it came to pass the second day after he had after he had slain Gedaliah, and no man knew it, that there came certain from Shechem, from Shiloh, and from Samaria, even fourscore men having their beards shaven and their clothes rent and having cut themselves with offering and incense in their hand to bring them into the house of the Lord. These are not holy men. They were bringing in things that were not meant for God. They were bringing in as the book, what is it? The oh, where's it written down at? You guys know I have a million and one of these things written down on little notepads in front of me, and they always get buried. Oh, where's it at? I don't even have it in front of me anymore. It's buried. I have I have four layers. One, two, three, four layers of. <laughs> this is so sad. I have four layers of notepads or little little uh little notepads in front of me on my desk. Oh, this is so messed up. Anyways, one of the apocryphal books said that whenever King of Babylon took over Jerusalem first thing he did was he sent his people into the temple to start doing the abominations on the temple of God. The way you can tell, these were, were not the men that uh, 
that were the holy men of God. Well, for starters, they're uh, having their beard shaven and their clothes rent. Okay, that could be nothing. Because you remember, one of the ways that whenever someone really truly gives themselves over to God is they will shave themselves. Uh, you will also see it, though, whenever whenever a... Uh, Whenever a conquering army comes in and takes the people, they shave the people. There's something about the hair. I've talked about this before, too, is, you know, like Samson. Samson said that no razor had ever come to his hair before. His hair had never been cut. That's where all his power came from. And then suddenly, out of the blue, his hair gets shaved and he loses all, loses all his power. And just that little tiny bit of hair started growing back and he got his power back. So there's something to it. There's there's something to that. So there's a sacrifice that is being made. I don't know what it is. I just know that there's enough evidence there to point that there's so other people have said it besides me. Somebody first said it I, I, in a video a while back, and I said, well, wait, you know, that kind of makes sense to a point. Um... Somebody, you know, some people say that it's it's a transmitter to God. That's why God tells it's why God tells the Hebrews don't shave the sides of your beard or whatever it is. Don't cut your hair. You can let it grow. That's there's something to it. I don't know why there just is. Um, so that's not anything. Having their clothes rent inside of the temple, that doesn't mean anything. Because, you know, again, you don't put on your Sunday best. I, I've had this argument with people before. You don't need your Sunday best. God doesn't care. He would rather you come to him in rags with a pure heart than come to him in the finest clothes, sitting in the best, the best seats of the temple with an impure heart. He, it doesn't matter. But it's having cut themselves. And I'll even look it up. There is a law that says that you are not to bring a blade or anything to the clothes rent. Let me just make sure. Having cut themselves to penetrate the cut, to cut oneself, to gather in troops or crowds. Is that you are not supposed to do that. That is actually what demons do. That is a witchcraft offering, the giving of blood. Do not cut yourself. These are not holy men of God. These are men of Babylon bringing the abomination into the temple. That's what that is. That's what the whole bloodletting thing is. That's what the whole, you know, when... You, you've heard about cutters. And I remember hearing about cutters a lot in the early 2000s. Kids that would just sit there and you know cut themselves. I've met many people, and I understand the concept. That is, sadly, that is a demon. That is a demon because the demon does not like flesh. I've talked about it before that. Um, when you see these so-called crazy loony people running through grocery stores, running through the streets, running through subways, whatever they're doing, and they're ripping off their clothes, ripping off their shirts, babbling to who knows what, marking themselves up, um, even these, even so much so to these, to the point of these, these, uh, these models and actors that are getting this plastic surgery that's making them look more and more like, you know, demons. Um, even tattoos to a point. But you believe it or not, you're cutting your flesh. But when, when these demons get in there and they're cutting the flesh and they're ripping the clothes off because they don't like the flesh... They don't like the flesh at all. When they get inside of these these people and you see it and you hear them talking and you, you just, you understand it. You know, there's a lot of people that, a lot of, um, 
normie channels that I listen to that they will talk about, you know, look at this crazy guy that, that, that did this earlier, you know, they sitting there babbling to himself that, you know, and then they do something crazy and wind up killing themselves or, you know, something else happens and they're like, you know, why, why would these people do this? And all I can think is, well, that's demon possession. That's exactly what that is. That's demon possession to the to its nth level, you know? Because they don't like the body. They they once they inhabit somebody, and if they don't feel comfortable, they will they will kick and scream and cut and dismember and do whatever it is. And I've seen enough crazy wicked, vile, and disgusting stuff in my life to understand that's what that is. And it's it's sad and it's twisted. And some people, they um a lot of these normies they will say, you know, well these people needed psychiatric help. They needed psychiatric help and there was one where the guy was talking about um <clears throat> He's talking about a girl who had started, you know, cutting herself, who had started um, acting strangely, yelling, screaming, hitting herself, hurting herself, uh, hurting her body, physically hurting herself. And the first people that were called were priests. They were trying to perform an exorcism. And this girl kept fighting back. And it went on for, I think he said six years, something like that. And the demon just kept hurting her more and more and more. And the guy, the narrator on the video kept saying that you could tell. <clears throat> Hold on a second. He said that you could tell she needed help outside of an exorcism. And all I can think of was, but you can hear her babbling. You can hear what she's saying. She was saying that she is preparing the land for her father to come to feast upon the flesh of, you know, whatever. And doing all this other stuff, ripping her hair out and taking knives to her skin and wasn't eating. And she had just the whole thing. And you were just like... That's demon possession. I think they might have been on the right track. They couldn't get at, they couldn't get rid of the demon, but they were definitely on the right track. Psychological help? What would a psychologist have done? The psychologist would have probably uh, psychologist might have probably, you know, prescribed some medication. Which of course is this world's sorcery. It is by their pharmacia that they have been deceived by their sorcery. So all that would have done is just dulled the body so that the demon could have moved further in. That is exactly my thoughts on that. And nobody has to like it. But that is that's how I think it works. And you see that time and time again. Why do you think that they prescribe medication for damn near everything now. Especially if somebody is having mental episodes. You know? Somebody's freaking crazy. The first thing you think is, oh, they just need their medication. What if that's not it? What if the sorcery, what if the, what if the medication is what makes the body accept the demon more? Now, I'm not saying that's for everybody. I'm not saying that, you know, your, your grandmother, your mother that's suffering from dementia that takes a pill that makes them better. I'm not saying that at all. That's, that may or may not be a completely different thing caused by a completely different evil in this world. I'm talking about the ones that are going out there and, you know, yelling and screaming into the night, and mumbling to themselves and, you know, scarring themselves on purpose and, and doing all the crazy stuff. The first thing you think is he's off his medication. Maybe it's not. Maybe he just needs somebody to go over there and 
you know, tell him by the power of by the power of Christ, I command all demons to leave this body. Maybe that's just what he needs. I don't know. I'm not saying that's what should happen. I mean, you start dealing with that stuff. I'm, I am definitely not so pure of heart that I could walk up to somebody and put, lay my hand on them and, and say, you know, I'm not that. I've, that's a bit much for me. Of course, I've already said if we had faith as a mustard seed, I know I'm not there yet. Uh, we are, we are, uh, making ourselves as, as good and pure as we can with the Lord's help. But I don't think most of us are ready for that. Ready for that level of, of, uh, faith just yet. Um, anyways, going back to this. They had their beard shaven and their clothes were in and having cut themselves with offering an incense in their hand to bring them into the house of the Lord. That doesn't mean that they were bringing it to the Lord. That means that they were bringing the abomination into the house to worship their gods. That was part of the problem that got themselves in, you know, into this mess in the first place. So this was the king of Babylon. He was already starting to change things. It says it in another book. I don't remember if it was Ezra's or if it was... Uh, um, oh, I want to say it was Second Esdras. That's what I want to say. And I got my... No, I don't have my apocryphal book with me. It's packed up. Man. Not having my basement is killing me. It really is, because all my books are packed up, and I'd have to go digging for them. Anyways. So they were bringing him into the house of the Lord. And Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, went forth from Mitzpah to meet them, weeping all along as he went... And it came to pass, as he met them, he said unto them, Come to Gedaliah the son of Achim. And it was so, when they came into the midst of the city, that Ishmael the son of Nethaniah slew them, cast them into the midst of the pit, he and the men that were with him. So Ishmael, he's already killed the he's already killed Gedaliah, he's already killed everybody that was around in there, he's already killed the Chaldeans. He's already killed the armies. I mean, he's pretty much slain everybody. He sees these Babylonian priests that are bringing the bad offerings into the house of the Lord, tells them to come up, slays them too, and starts throwing them into this pit. Verse 8, But ten men were found among them that said unto Ishmael, Slay us not, for we have treasures in the field of wheat and of barley, and of honey and of oil, or and of oil and of honey, so he forbear, and he slew them not among their brethren. Now the pit wherein Ishmael had cast all the dead bodies of the men, whom he had slain because of Gedaliah, was it which was it which Asa, the king, had made for fear of Baasha, king of Israel. Asa, the king, had made for fear of Baasha, king of Israel. And Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, filled it with them that were slain. And that may or may not be another story that I have not heard, or I may have glanced over. It's apparently a guy made a pit for fear of the king of Ishmael, or the king of Israel, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I don't know that story. Maybe that's a story we should look up. Then Ishmael carried away captive all the residue of the people that were in Mitzpah, even the king's daughters and all the people that that remained in Mitzpah, whom Nebuzar Aden, the captain of the guard, had committed to Gedaliah, the son of Achim, and Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, carried them away captive and departed to go over to the Ammonites. So he killed all the men, he killed all the armies, he killed all the priests, and then he took everybody else and he brought them back up to, to the Ammonites. You're going to poke that Babylonian bear. <laughs> you know? Because you know? again, it, it started out, oh, hey, look, you know, Jerusalem has fallen. We can go take it back. And so he's he's basically, he's knocking on the Nebuchadnezzar's back door is what he's doing. So, verse 11. And this goes all the way to the end. Great. Verse 11. But when Johanan, the son of Korea, 
Korea. I've been saying Korea. <laughs> Korea. Johanna and the son of Korea and all the captains of the forces that were with him heard of all the evil that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had done. Then they took all the men and went to fight with Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and found him by the great waters that are in Gibeon. Now it came to pass that when all the people which were with Ishmael saw Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, then they were glad. So all the people that Ishmael had carried away captive from Mitzpah cast about and returned and went unto Johanan, the son of Korea. But Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, escaped from Johanan with eight men and went to the Ammonites. And then took Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, all the remnant of the people whom he had recovered from Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, from Mitzpah. After that, after that he had slain Gedaliah, the son of Aachim, even mighty men of war, and the women, and the children, and the eunuchs, whom he had brought again from Gibeon. And they departed, and dwelt in the habitation of Shimham, which is by Bethlehem, to go to enter into Egypt. Because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them, because Ishmael the son of Nethaniah had slain Gedaliah the son of Aachim, whom the king of Babylon made governor in the land. Okay, so there's a lot going on there, so we're going to go back through it. But when Johanan, this is verse 11, but when Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, heard of all the evil that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had done, then they took all the men and went to fight with Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and found him by the great waters that are in Gibeon. Okay. Now it came to pass that when all the people which were with Ishmael saw Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, then they were glad. Well, those were all the people that they had left, that they had took, the people that he did not kill. All the women, all the children, all the daughters, of whatever. What else did it say? All the king's daughters, all the people that remained in Mitzpah. Who remained in Mitzpah? It was poor Israelites. It was the poor people that the king of Babylon said, you will tend to the flock, or tend to the flocks, tend to the fields. You will tend to the fields. You will tend to the vineyards. I'm giving you this. All you have to do is listen to me. All you have to do is follow my rule and I will give you these things. So it was all these people. 14. So all the people that Ishmael had carried away captive from Mitzpah cast about and returned and went unto Johanan, the son of Korea. But Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, escaped from Johanan with eight men and went to the Ammonites. Then took Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, all the remnants of the people whom he had recovered from Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, from Mitzpah. After that, he had slain Gedaliah, the son of Aachim, even mighty men of war, and the women, and the children, and the eunuchs. Very sorry about that. And the women, and the children, and the eunuchs, whom he had brought again from Gibeon. Then took Johanan, all the captains of the forces that were with him, all the women of the people, and all the women, all the children, and the eunuchs whom he had brought again from Gibeon. And they departed and dwelt in the habitation of Chimham, which is by Bethlehem, to go to enter into Egypt. So Johanan took all those people from Mitzpah, since they were taken up to Gibeon, and he decided to take them back down to Chimham, and then to take them down into Egypt. Okay, because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them, because Ishmael the son of Nethaniah had slain Gedaliah the son of Aachim, whom the king of Babylon had made governor in the land. There is still more to this story, I'm sure. 
I, I got a feeling that we're going to hear more stuff about this. It's just a history lesson. You know, it's just a, it was a, uh, it was a way for them to say, you know, this was the king, this king got slain. You know, this is, again, this is from a separate hand other than Jeremiah. Jeremiah wasn't seeing this. He was still, well, he had been let go. And he had been told you can go pretty much anywhere you want to go. He he went to dwell. Where was he in? Let's go back. He was told to go. Oh. Well, shoot. Maybe he was. Why was I thinking that he wasn't there? Okay, so I was wrong. See, I'm not perfect. He was told, then Jeremiah, then went Jeremiah unto Gedaliah, the son of Aachim, and to Mitzpah, and dwelt with him among the people that were left in the land. So maybe Jeremiah did get to see all this. Huh. I thought he went somewhere else. I, that was That's my fault. That's why we read these things like this. So there we go. So there we go. He was there. He could have very well have seen all this. Jeremiah could have been right in the middle of, of all of this. Because he would have been taken out of the land. He would have been taken out of the land with all these other people. And carried away. And then whenever um, Johanan, the son of Korea, had come up to take these people back... He would have taken him, you know, down to Egypt. Maybe Jeremiah is going down to Egypt now. Who knows? So we shall be finding out. 42 is a big one. 42 is a big one. All right. So there we go. That's now that I have that out of the way. <laughs> now that we we have some kind of understanding of what that is um yeah I didn't I didn't really have too much else to talk about uh, I it's been a weird morning it's gonna be a weird rest of the week is it Thursday is it Thursday really holy smokes it's Thursday ugh feels like time is going faster and faster. Your Bible even says time will go faster and faster. I just can't believe it's Thursday already. I feel like I lost a day. I really do. I feel like I lost a day and, and now it's like... Man, our team meeting is today. Shoot. <sighs> oh, well. <laughs> The calendar, the calendar's so messed up. I'm just so, I don't know. I'm not really drained. I'm just like, I'm not really drained and I'm not really lost. It, it's just that it feels like I'm losing time and we have some, uh, we have some things going on in the family outside of stuff that I don't want to talk about that, you know, have been popping up that uh, it's enough it's enough to you know, tax my mind and not only that but I've been just working, cleaning out some uh, old hard drives of just junk and uh, it's just been it's been one of those weeks it's been one of those weeks, you know. It was a full moon. What was that Sunday? When did we go out? I think it was Sunday. I don't know. I'm getting trapped in the house too much too. <laughs> I need out of this house. I already, I already told my wife. I said I, we we need to get out of this house. I feel like I'm I'm getting cabin fever. I really am. We've been trapped in this house way too much. Um, I am. 
she keeps wanting to go out to uh, to different places, and I'm like, I don't want to do that. You know, to just the normal stuff that people do. You know, go out to concerts and go out to other things, and I'm like, I'm I'm not being called to do that stuff. I said at best, there are a couple of uh, a couple of different things that I would like to go see, I'd like to go do, but I don't want to go. I don't want to go do all the normal, normy socializing. You know, we're not those people anymore. You know, I mean the old the old world is dead for us now. It's, it's time to look forward. But what can we do? What's left? And it's hard to find it's hard to find a church that even has half of of our ideals. You know? I mean at best we can talk about somebody said, you know, what about Seventh day Adventists? And I was like, Yeah, but all they care about is making sure that they don't do anything on Saturday. They're not really, you know <laughs> they're still out there eating pork on Christmas. I'm not you know, we can't do that. What do you want me to do? It's hard. I think the only other thing I saw was uh, we passed by a... Uh, I, I thought it was humorous, too. We went to a house and garden show with, uh, with her mom. Uh, I thought it was interesting, you know, to just go out and see what we could do with the house. And um, on the way there, we passed by a uh, we passed by a building, and it said Hebrew Israelites um, something. I don't remember what it was. And I was like, "Well, those would probably be the best people." But then again, you know, they're, they're probably gonna they they may or may not be the kind that says that you know all white people will be subjugated unto them in the end times. And I was like, "Well." Maybe not. I don't know. It's hard, man. It's it's hard to be out here. I need friends. Cause I have nobody. Like I said, I came from a came from a heavy metal background, and all of my old friends that I used to have, not all of them, but a good majority of them that I've had up in Indiana, they've uh, God, they're so satanic now. Just. It was one thing whenever you were wearing, you know, you were wearing the upside down pentagrams and, you know, you were doing the, doing the devil horns and doing all the other stuff to piss off the normies. It's one thing to do that. It's another thing entirely whenever you look back on it and these guys are seriously talking about Satan worship. And I'm like, what, what, wait, what? I mean, they've, they've gone full bore into it. I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute. Yeah, this was all just for a song and dance. This is something else entirely. Now I see it. It's, it's what I've said before is that, you know, it's scary. You look back on your old friends and you, you can see that they have gone full satanic communist and you wonder <laughs> you really wonder how people could have been turned so quickly within like three years of you know the lie the great lie of the past three years because they wanted to believe it they were they were almost two steps in, you know. Now some of them have completely dove into the deep end, and it's like it's unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable, and I can't even talk to these people anymore. You know, I unfriended most of them, and the ones that were talking to me towards the end, as soon as they found out that I had come to a new revelation of, of life. They either dumped me outright. Some of them blocked me, which is sad, but some of them, they just, they tried to pull me out of it. 
they did. They did their best to say, oh, you're just, you're just being, you're being tricked and manipulated. <laughs> you're, you're being tricked and manipulated. And, you know, Christianity, that's not what you think it is. Don't listen to the Bible. The Bible is written by men. And not even asking me how I came to this point. All they wanted to do was to wake me up out of my dream, quote unquote, my dream. Not even, not even asking why I turned, how I turned. They were more worried about getting me out than they were worried about asking me if it's even doing me any good. Which is exactly, you know, pretty much exactly what I mean. <sighs> all right. I have to go. I shall talk to you all later. God bless everyone. You take care of yourselves. I know there's a lot of people that are in the same boat that I am. Um, especially with, uh, especially with people. Because it's, it's pretty bad. That's pretty bad. People are just getting off the rails anymore. And it's hard to find places. It's hard to find people that you can just hang out with, you know, just to, just to be with that it won't turn into an argument over religious practices, you know? I mean, I'd, I'd love to go hang out at, you know, some people's houses, people that I know that, you know, they'd love to have us over, but then they want to pull out the pork sausages, you know, they want to talk about what we're, what our plans are for different things. They want to, they wanted to talk about, <sighs> Just all kind of garbage. I don't have anywhere I'm going with that. I shall talk to y'all later. God bless everyone. Take care of yourselves. I will uh, I'll see you tomorrow. I mean, tomorrow's Friday. That's it's, it's amazing. Tomorrow's Friday. All right. Take care of yourselves.